Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Sarah Milkovich, who is a planetary geologist and systems engineer at NASA JPL, where she currently works as the lead science systems engineer on Mars 2020 rover. Sarah specializes in the science operations of robotic spacecraft, bridging the science and engineering teams. And today, she will speak with us about the Mars Perseverance rover. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Milkovich. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, here, let me uh, start my slides. Um, hold on a sec. Okay, um, yeah, I am a member of the surface operations team for the Perseverance rover currently en route to Mars. Um, it's been a long road getting here. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about the science that we're going to do. I think this is a just a phenomenally exciting, uh, exciting mission. And um, so I'm hoping to share some of that with you today. Um, as most of you probably know, uh, Mars today is a very cold desert. Um, but from our decades of scientific exploration of Mars through um, through our telescopes and also through our orbiters and landers, um, we now believe that ancient Mars, so Mars about three and a half to four billion years ago, was very different. It had a lot of um, surface liquid water that might have, it might have been oceans and lakes sitting on the surface or under a layer of ice, but still a lot of evidence in the shapes of the rocks and the chemistry of the rocks for um, extensive water systems on ancient Mars. Part of what's so interesting about this is that from what we've learned in geology studying the Earth, we think that ancient Earth was also very different from modern Earth. And actually ancient Mars and ancient Earth were similar in their environmental conditions. Why is that so interesting? Well, let's look at what was going on on the Earth about three and a half to four billion years ago. We, uh, we had life already on the earth. We have evidence for, for ancient life uh, starting back somewhere in that time frame. Um, and th so the, the, the fundamental idea behind a lot of current Mars research is if, if there was ancient, if ancient earth and ancient Mars were so similar, and if life started on earth back in that time frame, why couldn't it have started on Mars as well? And, and that's really what our rover is all about. Um, so what kinds of life are we talking about? What are we looking for? Um, our class, what you think of usually as fossils, so, you know, not even dinosaur bones, but like the imprints of leaves or, you know, fish, like classic fossils, these are all less than 650 million years old. This is very much not what we expect to see um, if, if life existed on Mars, it's not going to be in the form of trilobites or anything like that. We're looking, we're talking about microbial biosignatures. So these are very subtle patterns in the rocks um, that tell us that there were processes present that had to have been in, uh, that could only be in the presence of biology, in the presence of life. So we're talking about ancient microbes. This is a picture here of somebody pointing at some of these uh, microbial biosignatures. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about what those are. So there's these things called stromatolites, and this is really some of the most primitive forms of life. These are modern stromatolites in Shark Bay, Australia. Um, and what a stromatolite is, is it's basically an algal mat that is very sticky on the top and then um, dirt, fall, get stuck there. They live in shallow water and dirt gets stuck on the top. And another layer of algae, the algae kind of migrates up above the dirt. And then there's another sticky mat and you slowly have this building up of layers of dirt that's sort of welded together by these um, microbes. So these are modern stromatolites, but we uh, have also seen ancient stromatolites. This is some of the most ancient form of, uh, of life. This is most ancient biosignature that's pretty well recognized by the, the scientific community. These are three and a half billion years old and they are in um, an area in Western Australia. And um, 
so this is if you took those domes from the previous slide and you sort of cut one in half, you would see this this structure. Those are the layers of um, of, of dirt that have been built up and welded together by these microbes. So now the thing is, is that uh, we can only find when we're talking about this is the time period that we've we've looked back as far back as three and a half billion years and we've seen evidence for life on the earth. The issue is that we don't know that much about it and we don't know uh, much about how did it get started and that's um, a major reason for that is we just don't have the rock record to look back that far. You think there's first there's the the difficulty in recognizing it but then but but there's also the difficulty in just finding rocks that are that old. Um, so these yellow splotches on this map are rocks that are older than 3.6 billion years old. Uh, we have plate tectonics that recycles most of our, that's recycled most of our planetary surface. Now the thing is that on Mars, we don't have plate tectonics. And so a huge portion of the Martian crust is very ancient. Um, so it, it might be that we have a better record of that time period on Mars in the, in the rocks than we do on the Earth. Um, so fundamentally, we think that going to Mars and looking for the evidence of ancient life in the rocks of Mars will not only tell us about Mars, but it will also tell us about the Earth and it will tell us about um, how easy or hard it is for life to start. Because right now, wherever we go, wherever we look, there is life. Um, but, but that's a planetary data set of one. And so we want to, uh, we want to go to Mars um, to, uh, to, see, to see if, that's, if that holds up. Um, how might we detect ancient, possibly non-Earth-like life? Um, the, we're, like I said, we're not looking for dinosaur bones or oil deposits or anything like that. Um, we're going to be looking for particular kinds of molecules, organic molecules, um, biominerals. We're looking for at the chemical structures in the rocks and the physical structures of the rocks. We're going to put all of these things together. We're, we're going to be looking for um, chemical disequilibria that, uh, that you find in the presence of life. Um, we're going to be trying to put all these lines of evidence together to say, was there, could there have been, could these have been formed by life or not? Um, so that's uh, super ambitious and super difficult to do with a rover, but we are, that's our rover. The Perseverance rover um, is all about understanding the possibilities for life on Mars. Um, our, our major focus is on ancient microbial life, but we do also have a fourth goal, which is about preparing for the eventual uh, presence of human life on Mars. So here's our rover. Um, it is very much based off of the Curiosity design, um, although it has various uh, engineering upgrades. Uh, it has a whole new set of instruments. Some of them are the next generation version of instruments that you see on Curiosity, and some of them are brand new, uh, new design, new types of instruments that have never been flown to another planet before. Um, we are an international collaboration. Um, so we have, we're at about 400 scientists on our science team and they are from all around the world and many time zones. So that's uh, going to be an, an adventure for operating this. All of us have to come together and, and work together to operate this rover and do some fabulous science. Um, Let's see. So uh, I just wanted to highlight we have subsurface radar. So as we're going to drive around, we're going to look below the surface with our, our ground penetrating radar um, to uh, look for changes in the layers of rock below us and maybe if there's any, um, any aquifers or anything like that below us. As, we, as you drive around, of course, um, you look if you're a, a geologist or even just somebody exploring you go to a new look. You need to look around at your new place. So we have MassCam Z, which is a zoomable panoramic camera. Um, we'll be taking color, zoom, stereo images. They're going to be fabulous. 
we have Super Cam, which is Chem Cam on MSL on Curiosity, but with but it's got two lasers now, so it's super. Uh, this is going to be shooting lasers at rocks from a distance to look at the um, the, the composition of the rocks. Uh, we have our weather station to know to to um, understand what the that sort of surface atmosphere transition area is like. And then we have at the end of our arm, we have uh, Sherlock and it's Sherlock is a UV spectrometer um, with about 150 micron spot size and Pixel is an X-ray spectrometer again with about 150 micron spot size. So we're going to be making very fine scale maps of the, the composition of the rocks that we see. And of course, you can't send Sherlock anywhere without Watson. Watson is our, uh, our hand lens camera at the end of the arm. Uh, so Sherlock, Watson, and Pixel all work together. These are this is some data that the sort of lab bench version of these instruments during development took of uh, of a stromatolite. And so what you're seeing is that you're seeing that there's there's chemical differences that follow the shapes, the the morphology of the the patterns in the rock. So we've got um, we're, we're by putting together what is the elemental, the, the patterns and elemental abundances and, and what elements those are, the mineralogy and the patterns in the mineralogy, plus what minerals they are like these, um, there's some organics, uh, there's, there's types of minerals that form in a, in a water environment. Um, and so putting that all together, this is, this tells us, this, there's a lot of signs of evidence here that what we're looking at is a stromatolite. And so this, is a picture from Earth and data set from Earth. This is what we, um, it's our dream, basically. Our dream would be to be able to uh, I'd see something like this on Mars. Um, but of course, that's, it's really difficult to, uh, we've got, you know, these ancient rocks a long way away. We're trying to investigate them with a rover. Uh, how can you be sure if they've got life uh, evidence of ancient life or not, uh, it's very difficult. So that's where our, th our third objective, sample caching, comes in. We are going to be drilling uh, cores of rocks. Um, they're going to be about the size of a pencil, and we place them in tubes and place them on the surface of Mars as we are exploring so that a future mission, which is, you know, still in negotiation, um, uh, will come and um, fetch those samples, put them onto an ascent vehicle and launch them in orbit around Mars. And then we will have a, f a third mission come and scoop those up and bring them back to, to Earth for analysis in our labs because there's so much um, cutting edge research that to, to really answer the question definitively, are we seeing evidence of ancient life in these rocks? Um, we have to do the kinds of analysis that you, you have to, you can only do on Earth. You can't miniaturize it and make it robust enough to launch on a rover. Um, our fourth objective is to prepare for humans. And I believe that earlier in, uh, in this meeting, you had a presentation from the MOXIE PI, Mike Hecht, who probably told you a lot about this, but um, one of the, Things, of course, we want to do is, is figure out, can we use Mars, the resources available on Mars, to help us as we, um, we send people to Mars? People need a lot of stuff. People need more stuff than a rover does. Um, and one of the major things is oxygen. And so what we're trying to do is suck in the carbon dioxide of the Martian atmosphere and basically run it through a fuel cell in reverse and spit out oxygen. Um, the idea is that we know how this works on the Earth. We think we know how it ought to work on Mars, but let's go try it out and see how it breaks on Mars and see if we can explain how, it, how it's breaking so we can build a better one for the eventual uh, time when humans have to rely on it. We also have a technology demonstration, uh, the helicopter ingenuity. I'm not really going to talk about this, um, but it's it's going to be it's it's basically like a quadcopter uh, that uh, we're going to test out if we can fly around on Mars to to do some reconnaissance imaging. And of course, uh, we had to scramble uh, to get this whole thing finished up, being built and launched during a global pandemic, 
And one of the last things that got added to the rover itself was this plaque to honor the healthcare workers um, uh, who have been just working so hard around the world and also helped us um, be safe as we as we finished we put the final touches on this rover. Um, so this was the last image of the rover itself. It's there um, tucked into packed up and tucked into the back shell uh, and the, there's the heat shield and the crew stage and the next time that all of these, this was in May, and then the next time the rover will be a separate entity is um, when about six miles above Jezero Crater this February. There it is um, being uh, put into the payload fairing of our launch vehicle. Um, and we got teased a lot about there's a ton of extra space there, but we needed the, the we needed everything to be wide enough to fit this, uh, sort of car-sized rover in. And we launched this summer and uh, just to, you know, consistent with how 2020 is going as a year, uh, we had an earthquake in California about 20 minutes before the launch. So um, this whole, you know, we've been, we've been on our toes for a number of reasons, um, but we are currently happily cruising to Mars. It is today, it is 123 days until landing. We are almost halfway there and our one-way light time right now is we're at about two minutes one-way light time to the uh, the spacecraft in february february 18th we will land um, and we will be using the same landing system as curiosity the uh the sky crane um we have a few technology changes that are letting us have um a smaller landing ellipse uh, and also what we call um, terrain relative navigation where we're actually able to land in a more challenging um, place on Mars than, than we could before. So this is we're taking descent photos as we come down and comparing them to a map that we have on board that um, from orbital images and we will use our uh, some of our fuel to divert away from the sharp pointy rocks and we do this because of course the engineers uh, you want to land safely so you want to land on something flat but geologists want to look at something interesting and uh, interesting rocks usually are the pointy rocks so um, once we get there, that's when this whole scientific adventure begins. We are going to Jezero Crater, which, um, so here's, here's the topography of Mars. Um, red is high and blue is low. Right on the boundary of the Northern Lowlands and the ancient crater, uh, the ancient Southern Highlands, we have a giant impact crater, the Isidus Basin. Um, Jezero is this little crater perched on the edge. One of the things that makes Jezero spectacular for us, um, here's, here's the crater itself. Uh, here's roughly our landing ellipse. It's shifted a bit since then. But when you look, you've got this inlet valley and an outlet channel. So a geologist or a geomorphologist looks at this and says, okay, dry riverbed, uh, you had to have had water flowing into this crater and it had to be there for long enough to fill up the crater and then uh, flow out on the other side. Not only that, there's this really spectacular feature here when we zoom in. This has all the classic signs of being a river delta, just like the Mississippi Delta or the Nile Delta. Um, and when you're thinking about where are places to go that could have uh, hosted early forms of life and then also trapped the evidence, for us of that early life for us to then go look at. River deltas are a fantastic place to go. Um, they're habitable environments. They bring in materials uh, quickly to that can trap uh, microbes. And um, so this is this is a delta in Alaska and the different colors sort of splotches you see there, those are different kinds of algae growing. So that is our future home. And we are already now, we're doing a lot of practicing operations. And we're also thinking about what kinds of samples do we uh, think we wanna take um, to represent this site uh, for future, future scientists studying the samples when they finally come back. Um, and uh, not just to 
describe the site and have wonderful samples, but also where would where do we think we'd have uh, good luck um, recording uh, habitable environments and ancient ancient uh, signs of life. So um, uh, that's really the um, the quick run through of the science and a little bit of the engineering of the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. Um, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Great. Um, this is Carrie Fay. Hello. Thank you so much for presenting this morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. And thank you for the attendees for joining us. Um, the first question I have is um, from Matt in California, and he would like to know, how deep will the subsurface radar scan? That is really dependent on what kinds of materials we're passing over. Um, so I believe that, uh, you know, so, so radar goes further through like ice than it goes through rock. Um, and it also depends on how many interfaces changing in, in physical properties we can see along the way. So it could be, um, as it could, you know, it could be just very little, or it could be, I think, um, I think 10 feet or 10, I'm not sure if it's 10 meters or um, is how deep. There is, uh, on the website, there's uh, information, there's a lot more sort of technical information about each of the instruments. And so um, I think that the, the RIMFAX team has put a lot more information about it there. Okay, great. The next question is from Andy. Um, and his question is, if microbial life did develop on early Mars, could it have evolved to at least slightly more complex life? We, like how, it depends on what you mean by complex. Uh, you know, life existed here on the Earth for an extraordinarily long time, single-celled uh, microbes, not even photosynthesizing, like not that level of, uh, of, of um, complexity. Uh, and actually when life started photosynthesizing and producing oxygen as a byproduct, uh, that poisoned our atmosphere and wiped out a huge percentage of life on Earth. Be, um, so uh, it's it's really hard to say. I don't think we know enough. I think like if if we're talking about like is it a cell with a nucleus versus a cell without a nucleus? Like maybe, but um, you know it's there's a there's a, a, there's a relatively short window of time that we think uh, Mars was habitable. Um, in a way that we recognize. Uh, and then the, the magnetic field shut down, the atmosphere uh, got stripped, uh, radiation levels on the surface increased. So it, it, um, this, the system changed and it's, if it changed slow enough for life to adapt or if it changed so fast that that was it. Okay, great. Um, the next question is from Anara, and um, her question is, when do you expect to get the samples back to Earth? That is a fantastic question that we would all love the answer to. Um, as you probably know, uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot, so first there's a lot of engineering challenges. There's also the financial challenges. Um, there's the, the getting the commitment right now, um, the sample return, uh, the, the phase two, the fetch rover um, and ascent vehicle um, are in the earliest stages of development. We have an agreement between NASA and ESA to work on those together. Um, so it's, it's really, we're, we are at the, the whim of uh, the space agencies and their budgets and the priorities that, they're, that our, um, our leadership has because, you know, there's, there's so many fantastic places to explore and things to do in outer space. And um, 
sometimes we have to take our turn. Uh, so I'm hoping we let we joke a lot about how like there's probably some high school intern on the project who's going to be like the PI for uh, analyzing the samples themselves. Um, so we're hoping that it's soon ish, <laughs> I guess, like, I, I know that's not a satisfactory answer. But unfortunately, that's the one I have for you. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Well, this is James Burke. Oh, sorry, Carrie. Um, this is James Burke, Sarah. So we have a question from Robert Slater. What is the, and it's about kind of the evidence for life. What is the significance of the ratios of oxygen 16 versus oxygen 18 and also carbon 12 versus carbon 13? Oh, yes. So I had isotopes on my sort of biosignatures slide. Um, there's, depending on uh what process what what metabolic process your form of life is running off of um the different isotopes can be uh will be sucked up at different rates because of the slight variations in their molecular weight um so so if you see um variations, if you see variations in these ratios that are bigger than you can explain through like a precipitation cycle or something like that, then that's evidence of, um, then, then that is another line of evidence that tells you that biology might have been present. Thank you so much. Um, I think that that is the um, end for questions. Um, did you have any ending comments that you would like to say? No, just uh, I hope you follow along with us. All of our images are going to be put out to the public, um, you know, shortly after they come down once we land and continue exploring Mars. So uh, go to our websites and come on the journey with us.